so I have I had my start. Uh, I could say I, I caught a bug, <laughs> a good bug. Um, I was working in a health food store in the early '80s. So, uh, student uh, got a working in in this this. Uh, Woman was teaching a workshop on making your own bread just for fun, and uh, this and that's the same culture I use now. Um, and that just got involved with it, and I, I didn't start the bakery till another maybe ten years later. But it was uh, it's very much fermentation is an old tradition. It's used for preserving. It's, it's actually a way of preserving food. Yes, yeah, well. Um, we often think of like when we use, hear the term processed food or preservatives, we think of in, ne in the negative. But of course, there's ways of processing and preserving that are that are healthy. And and sourdough is one of the old traditions that uh, most fermentation sourdough being one of them uh, that that was before the refrigerator. And we have a lot of modern techniques now to keep food safety high, and that they didn't have like. Cold, cold temperatures that consist in cold, or you know, canning, um, a variety of things that, that weren't so available. So people uh, would have stumbled on and worked out t t traditions of fermentation. There's theories like, you know, yogurt was discovered by s milk naturally souring, and um, they would have discovered that grains. So in the case of sourdough, uh, we don't know exactly, but you can theorize people. If you allow grains, uh, starches to go off in a controlled, well, an uncontrolled way, you'll actually, they come to life. And if and people would have discovered, because different cultures discovered it without talking to each other, so they would have just seen. So what, what actually happens is that you're kind of harnessing the natural, uh, either there's either bacteria or moles. So moles generally means yeast uh, to create the fermentation. So you, you start off with a wild process and you kind of harness it. So it's, it's almost like farming on a microscopic level. And so with, uh, in, the, in the fermentation world, there's, there's two groups of, there's, there's the molds and the yeast. And in the, mold, in, the, in the lactic world fermentation, you have your sauerkraut, your kimchi, your yogurt and kefir, and there's the different other ones, those sort of the, the dairy and the, the sauerkraut, kimchi, that's the how I think of the groups. And they're based on solely lactic fermentation. Uh, could it be arguably the most healthy because the, the transformation that happens there. And um, then you have the, maybe it's funny because when you say mold fungus, it doesn't sound good, but yeah. the fact is <laughs> they are. Uh, and so actually a lot of people start their day with, with a fermented food, meaning coffee, chocolate, tea. They're all fermented. And uh, coffee would be uh, bland. Uh, they would all lack flavor as well as digestibility. You know? um, so you also have um, miso and tamari, uh, olives, tempeh, of course, beer and wine. So it's not only for nutrition, it's also for fun. <laughs> so. Um, so they, these are all ways of preserving. Now, there's, there's my, my two favorite fermentations are the ones that are actually the most complex. Um, there may be others that are complex. In other words, they, can, they contain both the lactic and the, the, the fungus mold, whatever you want to call it, the wild yeast, essentially. And that's kombucha and sourdough. So they both... It's, it's generally argued in biology that um, bacteria and moles don't, don't get along. One wants to dominate and push the other one out. But uh, in the case of the kombucha and sour, um, sourdough, they actually work, the cultures work, they work together. And uh, I don't know as much about kombucha. In fact, I know from my kombucha master friends that they don't actually know as much as is known about sourdough. Sourdough is much more studied. So there's, they're still discovering things about kombucha with the explosion in the kombucha world. There's, there's a, a lot being learned still. But basically, they work together. And in the case of sourdough, you have 
a minimum of 25 species of wild yeast and a minimum of 50 species of lactic bacteria. And the lactic bacteria are actually the dominant ones. In a, in th that would be in an old culture. If you just started a new culture of your own, it, it would take a while to develop that complexity and stability. So it's sometimes I hear artisan bakers, uh, and artisan baking is actually supposed to mean it's fermented. That doesn't mean how pretty it is or the fact that it's got jalapenos or something. That has nothing to do with in the, the European tradition of artisan. It actually means it's fermented. It has a decent amount of fermentation. It may or may not have yeast added, which is not completely true fermentation, but it's still arguably fermentation. But if they use yeast, they'll lose just a little bit. But you'll often hear these um, sourdough bakers talk about uh, that it's the yeast. They don't, there's wild yeast. They don't talk, well, they, they actually don't realize that it's mostly lactic. And, and with, uh, with what, one of the, what was happening in a sourdough fermentation, it's lactic bacteria breaking down the starches, and, and that's what's making it more bioavailable, more digestible, and uh, like lowering the glycemic index and with the acidity. And the, the wild yeast do more of the rising. So that's their bigger component. And so that's, that's how they work together. Um, you also can get like what I call fake fermentation. You can see uh, some of the big supermarkets will have like sourdough, but it's actually a flavor. There are some like, for example, East Bakery, a huge bakery. That's still mostly true sourdough, that they still add yeast as well, but it's, I'm, I, I don't know the brand names of the ones that really are fake, but I've seen them, and because I've seen it as a, I'll get a price list, you can buy sourdough flavor. So that's really not sourdough at all. It's uh, like so many other sort of fake foods. It's, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a big proponent of um, Michael Pollan's uh, expression, eat food, mostly plants, not too much, but he does qualify it as not food-like substances. So <laughs> these fake sourdoughs are really not, are like a lot of crappy bread, they're not, they're food-like substance, they're not really a food to me. Um, so in the, in the health benefits, now let's see how we go through here, I guess, uh, some of the key things with, uh, this is ex this with fermented foods, <laughs> is uh, balancing stomach acids and uh, the hydrochloric acid in your gut is important and it'll be balanced more when you eat fermented foods. It'll actually compensate when you have a lack of uh, stomach acids or if you have an excess. So I, I often find myself, especially at work when I'm busy, I'm, I'll, eat, I'll get some bread I'll uh, put some um, cultured butter, which is kind of fermented, <laughs> and some sauerkraut, and I might have some miso, and it's just what I grab, and it's, it's all fermented. Um, that's, that's a, that's, that happens more with the lactic ferments. The, and another thing, and this will tie into mental health as well, but um, acetylcholine, someone can correct my pronunciation, <laughs> but it's a key neurotransmitter. And it's, uh, it's helps your body produce more of it, and it, it's used in the gut. As you might know, some, they're starting to see how much um, of our nerve, nervous system function is in the gut. Um, but it'll also help to produce it for the rest of the body, where it's used throughout the body. And that's, that's another key factor, and, and that'll um, tie in with uh, other, parts of mental health in the sense that uh, it's known that serotonin is 90% produced in the gut. And so if you don't have a healthy gut, that could, it can contribute to de depression and other, you know, it's not the factor, but it's one contributing factor. I, I have a friend who uh, struggles with depression and he was tested, and, and he's in a family where there's a lot of fermented foods, super healthy diet in the family, his wife's a big Polish proponent of healthy food, and uh, yet his gut is, is tested and low in um, the healthy flora. So uh, it was partially helpful to get a really, really uh, particularly powerful probiotic supplement. 
So that's, that's the mental health component is a part too. Um, so in, in uh, bread production, in a sourdough fermentation, most of that, we, we add this, this pre-ferment, and that, that's the overnight fermentation. And that's where you really get the, the most, you're kind of like building, you have a sourdough starter, like this, and uh, this is actually a gluten-free one with buckwheat. And we'll add, we would add about double that and for a batch of bread to make 100 bread. And it would, it's, it, you're basically making a bigger sourdough starter overnight and then feeding more flour and giving another rest. And it's about a 20 hour process. And in the, in the, um, you also, when you're working with the glutinous grains, you also want to work with the dough to develop that, that evil gluten that, that's, that some people have trouble with is actually what people like to develop the bread. Uh, but in the gluten-free version, we have things that we're trying to um, imitate with the gluten, but they don't, they don't need so much, need the, the, the resting and the, that's more just uh, the fermentation itself. So um, in that fermentation process with, with bread, you're, uh, it's the, you're lowering the glycemic index because it, apparently uh, because the acidity is increased is the biggest thing. But the, the gluten is actually reduced. Um, we can't make the claim, say on this bread, that it's low gluten. Um, and it's definitely not for celiacs because there still is gluten in here. Um, uh, until recently, I thought that the gluten was still fully there. Um, but not, uh, but just more digestible. I have a competitor uh, in Quebec. It's a bigger bakery than ours, and um, for their Camu bread, I think it's sold in Toronto. I can tell you what it's. I think it's, if I can remember that, it's Inewa. I think it's I N E W A. They make a claim on their Camu bread. Now, Camu is a very specific grain with a tight control on how it's grown. It's not GMO or anything. It's just they they have a way of making sure it's only one seed source. And they, their process was tested at a university. They tested it, and it's, uh, they can now make the claim it's less than 1% gluten, but they can only do it on their recipe. They, they make spelt bread, but they can't make that claim because they would need another test, and spelt sources vary a lot more. So it's just demonstrated the point that uh, a fully fermented bread, and even uh, grains with gluten, will be greatly lower the gluten. Uh, by the time it's fermented. So that's, um, and just, I've kind of been hinting at that a lot, that there's a, a whole lot of um, new leading edge science. Um, we, we always knew the gut had an important balance of healthy bacteria that we wanted to have. But is, is we're learning more and more, and I'm sure either in, in the school here or just your life, you've. There's been uh, different components of how how much a healthy gut plays, and f the fermented foods again are contributing to that. And they were traditionally a part of our diet. And um, there's it mentions there that there was there was for, just as an example, there was a typhoid outbreak in Europe, and they they found that there was they could extract something from sourdough that helped people deal with it. Um, I expect there'll be more discoveries of, it's, it's almost like it's, it's this whole world. Uh, in our gut, in the microbiome, that's uh, finding more and more studies that of components of health. So I guess what I'm really saying is there's a new, there's a new world out there that it, we've sort of dis discovered all the uh, parts of the world geographically and. Um, but it's, it's kind of like maybe going to the Amazon where they're finding new species. Um, a big thing in um, with grains, uh, nuts, seeds, it's important. Uh, I'm jumping ahead, let me go back to that. Or is this one that talks about phytic acid? Here we go, phytic acid. So um, phytic acid is something that's found in all seeds. And it's anti-nutritive. It doesn't mean if you eat, you get no nutrition if you don't take care of it. But it does reduce the nutrition. 
of uh, the, the, so for example, if I was to take this spelt that was in here, and it's in the whole grain, it's actually in the bran, so we all know it's better to eat the whole grain because of the fiber, but in that outside cover of the grain is uh, phytic acid. It's probably nature's evolved it to protect the seeds so it'll, it'll last longer and have a longer um, stability in nature before it has its chance to sprout um, because it's, it has this anti-nutritive quality. And so what it does, what, it, what makes it anti-nutritive phytic acid is it chelates um, magnesium, I forget, three or four minerals. It'll bind and so you'll lose some of the good qualities in that or in the grain or in other parts of whatever your diet is. So um, yeast fermentation takes the care of a bit of it. I don't really call yeast fermentation, but maybe it is. It, but sourdough takes care of almost all of it. The other ways to take care of uh, phytic acid are sprouting and soaking. And I'd say in order, soaking, sprouting, and sourdough fermentation r reduce phytic acid. Um, so I, you know, sometimes I find myself, I grab a handful of sunflower seeds or pumpkin seeds and think how that good that is. And I go, hmm, maybe I should only eat if it's sprouted or sub-fermented. So that's another key component of fermentation. And what was that slide about? I haven't looked at these for a year. <laughs> that's basically <laughs> just explaining the, just uh, the need for important you know, digestion, the different components. Um, so I do actually gonna make a little kick at the keto diet because I'm not against it. I think it's interesting. I think nobody ate that way. Uh, no culture rate, the keto diet is their only diet. I think one question that's not being addressed is the amount of fiber and prebiotics that are lacking in general. There's probably ways to deal with it. And I'm not saying it's, I think it's a healing diet for certain people, it has a place, but it's certainly, okay, what's this new diet? Am I gonna make a keto bread? No. Um, can't do everything, number one, and I don't think it's a sustainable diet for everybody. It has a place for some people, for sure. This, um, you know, raw foods diet, there's lots of specific diets that work for certain people in certain situations. But, um, Plus, plus, I would have to make charge about if it was organic, about eighteen dollars a loaf, I think. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and that's. Oh yeah, um, some interesting facts. Um, FODMAP diet, which is actually a very scientific diet um, that that helps with IBS and IBS-like symptoms, and. Um, it's interesting that the only glutinous grain that can be eaten in the FODMAP diet is fermented spelt. And they, this is a diet that they do real testing with each ingredient. Um, you may have heard of it, it was developed at an Australian university. And it's, it's F-O-D-M-A-P. Uh, I don't remember what it stands for. And if you look it up on Wikipedia, it'll explain why, because it's a long <laughs> bunch of scientific words. Um, oh yeah, Candida. Uh, candida is also, you know, um, people can get systemic intestinal candida um, overgrowth and have a variety of symptoms. Um, and that's, that's something, again, that with fermented foods, it's a bit specific depending on which practitioner you're talking to, because we, we had in our community a major candida physician, and he, uh, he's he would say you had to really watch even the lactic fermentations because you have to really be careful you don't introduce new molds. But in general, for a candida diet is, is uh, looking for no sugars and less starches, but if they're fermented, it's gonna be more likely digestible. And uh, so the, the lactic bacteria are definitely okay in a candida diet, and it's the more the yeast you don't want, even if they're not the actual candida yeast, they can still contribute. So that's, that's a, again, an, and that's also a, a diet that can affect mental health. Um, so, I read a lot. Uh, important thing with, with fermenting uh, is good water. So, sorry, but here in Toronto you don't have very good water, but, you know, it came from Lake Ontario, but the things they've added, and you want to, if, if you're, I, I'll talk more at the end, 
because some people may want to go about how you actually make sourdough. But with any fermented food uh, that uses water, I'm thinking especially kombucha and sourdough, but there's others, it's really good to use good water. So in sourdough, uh, deep well water is actually better than spring water because you need some minerals. Uh, my wife's nephew is a master baker in Germany. He's not a big purist about nutrition, but he really knows his baking. And it's, it's a much bigger bakery than ours. But for their sourdough, they, they bring in deep well water. For the yeast bread, they use city water. So just as a, his point of view is not nutritional, it's just how does it work well in his bread. So that is, you, the spring water will still work. Uh, at least have filtered water. Uh, because the chlorine is really going to work against, and the chlorine is there to kill things we don't want. It has a point, but it's not going to help you grow a healthy culture in, you know, whatever you're trying to make. Um, even if you're making sauerkraut, which doesn't have any water out of it, um, better to not have chlorine in it because you just want to keep the, 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 that fermentation going. Um, and Salt's needed just at the end, unrefined sea salt. A lot of people don't, mo like sea salt in general might as well just be salt. It's normally no different than Windsor salt. Most of it, when I looked into it 30 years ago, I think it's still the case, comes from San Francisco Bay Area. You, you know, you want it to be refined because you don't want what's in San Francisco Bay. Um, Himalayan salt's good. There's, we get salt from, uh, it's either from Portugal or uh, northern France where there's an old tradition of screening the, the water to reduce the salt from salt marshes and it's a very high standard of cleanliness. Because um, the main thing with the unrefined sea salts, uh, that the ones we get, they have a lot of trace minerals. So trace minerals are important for obvious reasons because we tend to lack them, but especially you find that our soils tend to be depleted in trace minerals. Um, with a uh, touch a bit on sauerkraut, because um, one of the three I know the most about are the lactic ferments, meaning sauerkraut and their its cousins, meaning kimchi and and like you can ferment beans or pickles, and they're all the the with pickles or beans you create a brine, so there you're adding water. With sauerkraut you're actually drawing water out of the cabbage. Uh, but in both cases, the lactic bacteria actually come from the vegetables. So you're not adding anything, there's no culture to add. Um, and there's different layers of different bacteria that grow in the... Uh, um, when you start a sauerkraut, there's apparently three different groups of lactic bacteria that somehow kind of magically appear. Like, I don't know how one takes over the other, but as this acidity lowers, one group of uh, bacteria replaces the other. And so it's a very stable environment. A um, couple books. This guy here, Sandor Cuts, um, he's written a more authoritative book. This was his first book. And I really like this book. It was this great introduction. It um, really encourages you to dive in. And uh, he, go, he touches on a whole lot of different fermentations. I haven't tried all of them. But um, I like how he makes it really accessible. And uh, he spoke at a fermentation festival that's held in Prince Edward County. Maybe there's one in Toronto, I don't know of one. It's sort of this fermentation world is growing. Um, so it's the first week of August if anybody wants to go. It's just a food festival. Um, this is a new one that I picked up uh, last year from, it's this, Noma is uh, often rated the number one restaurant in the world on whatever foodies rate, whoever, I don't know who decides that, but it's a very good restaurant. And um, they've, they've been doing some, I haven't d dived into this, as if, if I retire I'm going to grab this book more, I will retire one day. <laughs> it's, but it's like they're talking about fermenting plums and things like, uh, they, they're developing their own traditions. So um, it's another, it's, there, I'm sure there's others out there. Um, yeah, um, in the gluten-free world, you're actually seeing no fermented breads. Um, something's got lost in gluten-free bread, and obviously doing a shameless plug, but um, the fact is, 
I think most gluten-free breads, the vast majority of them are less healthy than the regular breads. In fact, the big name gluten-free breads are less healthy than Wonder Bread. Um, you know, obviously there's nothing good to be said about Wonder Bread really, but it's, if you just go by the simple basics of salt, sugar, fat, um, the carb ratio of one of the best selling uh, gluten-free breads in Canada, and it has the, it's, it's actually owned by a bakery that makes traditional breads with much higher quality ingredients for less money. And they have a carb to protein ratio of 35 to one. So we, we have a ratio like this one, it's seven, or we get, we're at uh, seven grams of protein, I believe, to 21 minus four for the fiber. Yeah, it's about three to one ratio. So I'm just making the point that something's been lost in the gluten-free world because they want to get air in it, and fair enough, people want air in their bread. I'd like to get air in, I gave up, I'm not going to have air, we're just going to have real healthy food that's as healthy as this one. And because um, obviously some people do better without gluten, and yeah, look, sure, look at gluten-free, but look at what's going into the bread, because that's the main food that has gluten in it. We all see gluten-free chips, like there wasn't gluten in it anyway. Um, so it's 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 pretty surprising to me that people aren't really looking the same degree. Uh, this is quite a lot of organic. Um, there are and, and some sourdough tr and some true sourdough breads in the traditional world, but it's because they want air, and to get air, you got to get all these starches in that have high high carb. Uh, simple shirt, you know, simple, refined. So that's uh, something I've noticed. Um, if you go on, do you want questions? Anybody? Is that one blue free? The, the protein? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have two bakeries. So we, we used to bake in one place when the gluten free things started off and we just do all these crazy clean outs. And so we've, we just opened that bakery uh, two and a half years ago. So yeah, they're. You'll see they're quite heavy, but um, you know, toasted and yeah. What, what's the ingredients in the gluten free one? So basically, we, we start everything with wet grain, and that's to make it more digestible as well, but also keep it moist because gluten free breads have a tendency to dry out. So this bread is actually very moist. And then a bit of olive oil, but flax meal. Sometimes their breads have either chia meal or flax meal as the gluten replacer. And this will be buckwheat flour, and the white, white protein bread is because we've added uh, hemp hearts and spread chickpea flour. So there's no sugar? In no sugar. Well, this one actually somehow came up with one gram of sugar in our nutritional mm -hmm. profile. Uh, we, we came from the hemp, hemp has no sugar. So. But uh, we don't add any, all the other ones actually have zero. So the reason why they put sugar in gluten, like healthier gluten-free breads, even like cane sugar or whatever, it's to make it moist? Or uh, it's to, air to feed the yeast to make it rise. Okay. That's, and I guess for flavor. Um, we're trying to educate people to know, educate your palate. Like, like I said, these, this doesn't make great sandwich bread if it's too, like, but for open face it does. Yeah. You know, toast it. Um, People not toasted pretty much any bread. Uh, I do. I toast that if it's not really fresh. So if you toast it, it's really good. Yeah. It's um, and it's moist. So like um, yeah, there's a lot of and like exanthin gum. Like what is that? I. It's not evil. It's not terrible, but it's certainly not some nutritional about it. It's a strange material if you ever handle it itself. I maybe I'm just going with my feelings of my hands, but it's like weird because it's slimy, slimy, slimy. Um, and, but they're probably more relevant, it's like potato starch, this starch, that starch. It's basically, they're not whole foods, so. Um, you know. yeah, that is one of the things I notice with gluten-free bread. Mm -hmm. It has tapioca starch, right. rice starch, potato starch. And I keep thinking that isn't healthy. No, it's not, and, and it's like, Sure. There's. I, I personally think most people on a gluten-free diet need to be. From just talking to my customers, they're not. There's trends of this, that, and we all see them. And sure, some people are just playing with it. They maybe don't need to be. But most people, I personally are just mildly gluten intolerant. I, if I eat pizza, I get digestive issues from 
well, if it's fermented, I, don't, I, I just need the stuff to be fermented. But everybody's different. But yeah, they just, just because it's gluten-free doesn't make it healthy. They may not get that crazy gut pain they were getting, yeah. but they're still getting, they're That's not me. getting anything. <laughs> so, so. Uh, I think they're trying to make the gluten-free bread more like wheat bread. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they use all of these things to, yeah. uh, to make it more tasty. Yeah, Mar here. Marketplace CBC did a thing on on the gluten-free trend a few years ago. And I think it's overall a good show, but they like to be sensational. So let's we'll see what they do with it. Well, they were, they were the one that showed me that this big name bread in the gluten-free world was, I think it had, it, 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 on just salt, sugar, fat, it was twice as bad as Wonder Bread. I think they literally compared it to Wonder Bread. Which is, you know, using the uh, subject of attack of bad bread. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a funny phenomenon. There are some better ones. There's some that are getting, you know, there's some movement in that direction. I know there's one in Toronto that's not us, it's good. In, it's getting some more whole stuff in it. But, yeah. Do we use the same kind of yeast for both the gluten free bread and the normal bread? Yeah, like the. In in a baking world, like ninety nine percent of the bread, there like there are other good sourdoughs and, and traditional bread, but most people use yeast for all the bread out there. It, it's the same single organism, oh. and they, they they don't absolutely have to feed it sugar, but they usually want to feed it a sugar to make it rise quickly. Mm -hmm. So it's a single species that they've isolated. There may be a few different ones, but they're basically the same. There's no. So, yeah. And that's, mm -hmm. yeah. And what is the best yeast to use? Best what? The best kind of yeast to use. I don't know. <laughs> if you're what making you yeast bread, I, I, I've never used yeast. Oh. Um, yeah, never bought any. Never did. I worked in a yeast bakery, but I just used what they gave me and that's 30 years ago. Oh. But, but um, how long will this, um, that, Start culture? Culture. How yeah. will it last? Okay, so so well, let's. Um, so I'll give like a tablespoon to anybody. You can okay. make more to create it. For okay. you. I have a, some jars out there, but um, I have a buckwheat and a spelt starter. Uh, we often call them starter culture. Um, it's basically the pro the process of like his book is a really simple explanation, but there's different. YouTube and whatnot, but I look at it as a week. Um, but the, I mean, it it's best if you feed it every week because, like, we 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 have a business; we feed it every day. But if you feed it once a week, even if you're not baking, that's best. If you forget and you leave it in the back of your fridge and say, "Oh no, it's if I ruined it," I've learned recently that someone demonstrated. I haven't had to prove it to myself, but it was a very good article that. He rejuvenated some, it would have looked, this would have looked kind of, see this looks alive if you look closely. But it would, um, I know what it'll look like. I've seen old starter when I used to not own a bakery because we feed it all the time. And it was kind of gray and you take the middle of it out and you rebuild it several times in a row. So when I say build the sourdough, the starter, you're essentially doubling it. So let's say I wanted to double this much because that's all, nobody needs this much at a home bakery baking, but you would, I'd have a bigger container, I'd add water to here, and the same flour as I'm using, and it would, then I would end up with this much, I would let it rise. It would take, uh, depending on the temperature of your room, three to five hours, and it's come to life, and now you're ready to use it to make your bread. And if you had left it in the fridge for a few months, mm -hmm. you'd do that process four or five times in a row. Because it's basically sort of dead, but they're actually apparently you can get those organisms. And this guy demonstrated um, mid. It would probably work on any culture. So if you want to always build it at least once, uh, or feed it, or whatever you want to call it. Before you are literally feeding it, giving it, and it kind of gets the the organisms come to life more, and then you can make your your pre-ferment or your uh, sponge. The different terms that are used. 
you can, uh, you can use fr fancy French Italian words. The guy who's on Netflix who I went to learn from, there's a show called Cooked, it's a Michael Pollan show. He calls it critters, and I like that because he's actually super knowledgeable and he wants to deflate all that sort of fancy language. Just critters. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, I, mean, I could go on about the process more. Do you want me to talk he's, about it? Okay, so, uh, best to, so if you're making bread at home and you want to take some culture home, the general rules of thumb are. You, you use half your flour overnight. So when we make a sponge, we make a sponge. We'll use, if you wanted to make uh, two bread, it's say weighs, doesn't, doesn't have to be an exact weight when you're making it at home. But this size, you would use about a kilo of flour and you'd use half that flour at night. You'd, so you, you could mix it in just a small bowl with some, you add the culture, about half a cup of culture. So you maybe make a cup of it and always keep some because you got to keep some for the next time. So you build a half a cup, turn it into a cup, and you put the half cup in their sponge. You mix it, uh, and so let's say what I'm going to say I'll say for glutinous grains because you want to develop the you want to get air in it. And, you, and if you're going to do gluten free, I recommend you do use a wet grain and you do use flax meal or chia meal in the process. But if it's just, uh, say, spelt, this, is, this, this has rice added as well, but generally you can use just flour, water, salt, nothing else, and the salt comes towards the end. And so you would add the flour, uh, so half a kilo, you'd mix it, just stir it, because you're not developing the gluten yet, and you would let it sit overnight, so maybe you want to be at home the next day, you're going to be on the weekend, maybe on Friday night you would mix it. And so you'd build the starter in the afternoon, late afternoon, and in the evening you'd feed the starter to, the, to this mix of one part water to one part flour. And I'm talking weight here, it could be volume. And in the morning it should be a little bubbly and it, you, you'll see it come to life. And then you add the rest of the flour. Um, the, the, you would add about another 500 grams of flour. That's exact measurement, but it doesn't have to be exact. You're actually, what you're looking, and then as you add the flour more and more, the second time it's going to get thick. Oh, you need to add the salt then. General thumb is 1% uh, salt of the weight of the bread. So that gives a modest amount of salt that tastes good and tempers the fermentation. And, you know, it's not too much or too little salt. So then you, you want, that's where you start working the dough. And that's the whole shaping procedure. You can use a machine. Uh, I've heard people using uh, bread bread makers, but they have to stop the cycle. Mm -hmm. So you can use sourdough in a bread maker. I'm told because I don't do it, but it's logical. You just uh, it's made to use for yeast, so it's like a two or three hour. And that stage where it sits, you just turn it off, let it sit overnight. So it can save you having to work it. But working the dough is fun. Good, you know. Mm -hmm. physical activity and so the simplest system is you got that overnight this, this build the starter make the sponge 12 hours roughly very roughly could be 10 to 14 hours and you'll learn from observation as I was saying in the introduction it's mm -hmm. like fermentation is a, a trial and error there's general guidelines but you'll learn by watching it Maybe you like the bread more sour. Maybe you don't like any sourness. We try to make our breads just not sour or just a bit. It's kind of like spicy food. If I made it really spicy, we'd have 10% of our customers. So, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. To yeah. Have, can you use the no meat bread technique? Yes. I, I don't know it, but I've heard of it, and I think it's logical. Basically, they just stir it a lot first. Um, yeah. I. I I've heard a lot of people with results of that. And so that in this, this is where I'm talking, where you want to develop the gluten, because the gluten is what gives you that nice chew. If you're going to go gluten-free, I think subscribe to the idea is, in either case, it's going to be heavier than bread with yeast. If you want to get a lighter bread still, and you want to add some yeast, and sort of what I consider cheating a bit, is add a little tiny bit of yeast and um, then you still get some effect of the sourdough. Mm. Um, so
so I think people, if they're buying packets of yeast, they, they're using a whole packet for a few bread. You'd use way, way less. You know, you would use like a tenth, if not, or not even that. You know, and you'll get more lift, but you still have some fermentation. Like I noticed, Stone Mill Bakehouse, big German bakery that got sold to one of the big chains. They're on TV now, and they have an ad. They talk about their fermentation. They still use yeast, but they are fermenting some. So it's sort of a compromise because it saves time and gets some more lift. So most sourdough bakeries are not fully sourdough. I only know of one other for sure in Toronto, that Shasha. I know he has a very high standard of volume of sourdough. Uh, there's probably some others. There might be some retail bakeries. But, yeah. I used to put uh, one uh, tablespoon of vinegar to the dough. I, I yeah. do as you say. I put it afternoon, then put the timer till, then yeah. I will get the bread next morning. But is it a good idea? You mean with sourdough or just on its own? No, with the, the dough. Yeah, I and wouldn't. I see, vinegar is to me not bad, but it's not going to. It's trying to get if you're trying to get sourness and you like that, there's nothing wrong with it. But it's not, it's not you're not going to get the same nutrition you get from a sourdough culture because you don't have this diversity of lactic bacteria. So it's kind of the fun of it too, the magic of working with an old culture. You can make your own culture too, and if you ever want to experiment, with it, you, you basically your your flour. It's usually it's a starch and it's usually flour and water just. To, and you just let it, what's happening when you create a culture is they're bringing in wild yeast from the air and the lactobacteria come from the grain, they're inside the grain and then they, if things go well you'll develop a nice complex mm. balanced culture. Um, but hey, they, they, it's, it's sometimes called friendship bread so that's why I'm sharing it with you because it's mm -hmm. not, I, won't, I don't sell it, we give it away. So mm. I didn't pay for it so why would I sell it? You know, you, you can buy some dried cultures, and I'm not against people making money on selling dried cultures, but it's really pretty simple. So people used to always share it in traditions, and, and that's something I, I didn't mention. It's like I find it fascinating. It's called sourdough culture and cultured foods, but it, it is a tradition of there's, there's no every culture has a fermented food few at least, you know, like even like. The Inuit who don't have any starches in their diet because there's so far north they only have meat. They, they ferment meat, you know. So it's uh, there's always some special foods, and some are pretty weird when they're not in your culture. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. so what do we do with the starter? Are you giving us some? Okay, so if you want to make bread like that, general processing, but to keep it, maintain it when you're not baking, just feed it once a week even if you're not using it is best. And then, so say you're not baking for a month, you want to throw it out, because you're gonna have some, you just throw in the compost. But it's best if you eat it once a week. But like I said, you can rejuvenate it if it's old. It kind of go, it'll look pretty funky. It'll look kind of like, oh, take the middle out and build it several times in a row and it'll come back to life. Yeah, have some old funky yeah. on there. Yeah. There are a few months, so yeah, well, I wanted you to tell me if it's still viable or should well, I dump I, it? But well, I think I, I, I will give it you a could take the mat out, you can rebuild it several times. You'll see it, it, it it's going to be like it's run out of food. and yeah. uh, But those organisms, if it's in the fridge, it is. Yeah. It is. It is. I mean, I don't think that would happen if it was kept not in the fridge. The they would just burn yeah. out, they would die. Yeah, There'd be nothing with it. it. Yeah, so that would be nice. Yeah. So you said we're feeding the water and just flour and water. And just flour. So like in this case, this is, this one's gluten free. I have a spelt one there, and but this it's actually the easiest. It'd be okay. We make an only buckwheat. That bread has we call it grain free, so we have to give it buckwheat. Okay. We our millet starter when we get we can feed it to our millet our buckwheat bread because there's millet in it. It actually comes to life much faster because millet's a true starch and buckwheat's not. And uh, so, yeah, I think the best is rice and millet if you're using gluten free as your food for the starter to make your starter. So, this is buckwheat, but you could turn it and you just feed it millet or rice because they're more uh, easily, they have more carbs for the food, for the, the critters. <laughs> so, so, um, go ahead. 
the starter that I have that's buckwheat. Can I just add that to it? You could, yeah. I well, might maybe just take some of this. So, I, like, I can, um, you you can put like, uh, I'll give her a bit like a tablespoon, yeah. and that's not quite enough, but you could build it. Okay. Just I, I'm sure there's buckwheat, whole grain flour in the store, mm -hmm. uh, you, but you can feed rice and millet. Those are the main ones we use. We make a quinoa bread, but we have to give it milled starter because uh, I find the quinoa is so much not a grain. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work so well. Um, I'm sure you can use oats. Uh, we were working on an oat bread for a while and it, it was working, but we just didn't go with it for reasons I won't get into. But basically, you can use oats. I'm probably forgetting something. And so then the traditional grains, of course, wheat's the most common, but spelt, cam, or ones with gluten in it are because that's why you want to do you like that dough, the stretchiness. Um, red five. I know it's a wheat, but is that a... Like it's an old variety. It's yeah. nice to keep alive. It's the variety that opened up the West and they developed it in Canada. So it's sort of very kind of almost like a patriotic grain. Right. And, um, but it's made a comeback as a very... It's made a comeback. It, it's, it's arguably nice. more digestible than regular... So it is. is but then correct? spelt is much older than red five. Yeah. Spelt is like red five and more. Um, but um, I find when I use red five, we make a wheat bread, a spelt bread, and camel bread. So you have like, sometimes we have red five for our wheat, but let's look at this. That's our heritage grain and the camel. Okay. The red five is good. Yeah, good. Um, and with regard to the starter, I know somebody who's been freezing it. I've heard of that. I don't really know much about it. He just pulls, pulls it out and I, I guess it works. I have heard of that. I'm not an expert in freezing it and people dry it because you can go to some of the health food stores and get a dry package and they just, um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's known the bacteria do live in through freezing. It's not like if you want to sterilize food, you don't freeze it, right? That's not enough. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's logical that the only thing I found is we've tried making dough and right, getting it to the last rise and then putting it in our fridge even, not just our freezer or the freezer, and it always loses something how much it rises. So that suggests that it stays alive, but it lost something, so you might want to feed it again after the freezer. Does he feed it right out of the freezer? Yeah, I think so. I mean, well, if it works, yeah. it could be that it's a specific culture that people found to work. The, if, it, you, if you make a culture, it'll take on a bit of its life of its own for you, for what you feed it, the schedule you give it. Because there's four variables in fermentation in general. You've got time, so the more time or less time, the more it ferments. You've got temperature, the colder or the warmer, the warmer, like it won't really ferment at the really cold temperatures. You've got intensity of starter. So like we, we make our starter less intense in the summer than we do in the winter. Um, and you've got the amount of starter. So the more starter, it's going to mean less time or more sour. Um, With regard to fermented vegetables, there's absolutely no way to, well, in the old days we used to say put down, like can them, jar them? The, uh, and they always has to be refrigerated. That's right, because if you use canning, you just, they're, well, y yes and no. Just like this bread is still nutritious, we've, we've baked it, we've killed any black and bacteria in here. They're not alive in here anymore. They're, they're, uh, did you want some starter if you want? Yeah, okay. I'll try to, I'll just, I'll try to keep you a jar then. Okay. If anybody has to leave, I can try to keep you a jar. I should. Yeah. Or maybe I should just stop now because it's time. <laughs>